A friend and I were discussing the Olympics soon after the closing ceremony. I remarked that I loved seeing people achieving the goals they had strived for their entire lives and performing at the top of their games. She, on the other hand, said she didn't like how competitive it was, with constant reminders of how many medals each country had won. It's the Olympics, I blurted out in disbelief. They're supposed to be competitive. A few days later, I was playing online Scrabble, and my opponent got two bingos in a row. A bingo is when you use all your letters to get bonus points, which is somewhat unusual at my level of play. The person typed, I'm sorry. I immediately typed back, may I ask if you're a man or a woman? The reply didn't surprise me. Of course it was a woman. I've never had a man apologize for legitimately gaining an advantage. Many women, especially those who grew up in the 1960s and 70s, never had the opportunity to participate in competitive sports. Until relatively recently, few of us served in the armed forces, attended military academies, or participated in other activities that required us to play to win. As a result, we don't know how to play the game, let alone play within bounds but at the edge, which will be explored further a little later in this chapter, and play to win without feeling apologetic or guilty. Worse yet, Many women view the whole idea of the game of business as something unpleasant, dirty, and to be avoided at all costs. Let's start with the most important lesson. Business is a game, and you can win it. As a matter of fact, women are born to win this game. I spend half of my time working with men, teaching them to be more like women. Of course, I don't quite put it that way, or I would be out of business. I coined the term feminization of leadership to describe the ways in which today's workforce responds more positively to stereotypically feminine behaviors than to masculine ones. I talk to men about the importance of things like listening, collaborating, motivating, and seeing the human side of their staff. These factors contribute to what's known as EQ, or emotional quotient. And EQ is the sine qua non for workplace success. On top of that, it's been shown that women exceed men in four out of five EQ factors, including self-awareness, self-regulation, empathy, and social skills. Women and men are equal on the fifth factor, self-motivation. Whether women do these things because they've been taught the behaviors and have had a lot of practice at them, or because they come naturally, really doesn't matter. To win the game of business, you need to capitalize on your high EQ. The areas in which women often aren't quite as skilled as men include knowing where the imaginary boundaries of the workplace playing field are, getting into the game, and understanding the unspoken rules for winning the game. Of all the coaching tips in this audiobook, the following are the most difficult for women to incorporate into their corporate skill set. Many of the suggestions are counter to everything we learned growing up. Resist the urge to skip the hard stuff. If you don't play, you can't win. Mistake one, pretending it isn't a game. The workplace is exactly that, a game. It has rules, boundaries, strategies, winners, and losers. Women tend to approach work more like an event, a picnic, concert, fundraiser where everyone comes together for the day to play together nicely. In our desire to create win-win situations, we unknowingly create win-lose ones, where we are the losers. Playing the game of business doesn't mean you're out to cause others to fail, but it is competitive. It means you are aware of the rules and develop strategies for making them work to your advantage. An interesting scenario played out that underscores this uniquely feminine phenomenon. The women's softball teams of Western Oregon University and Central Washington University were competing toward the end of the season when a senior who had never hit a home run during her college career came up to bat and smacked it over the fence. As she was running toward first base, she tore a ligament in her leg and could no longer run. 
Knowing her situation and not wanting to deprive her of one last chance for a homer, players from the opposing team carried her around the field to touch each base, allowing her to have officially hit a home run. When was the last time you heard this happen in any sport where men were playing? To the contrary, as a male Nestle executive said to me, when a man's friend wins, a little piece of him dies. Although I think it was a nice thing to do, and maybe even the right thing to do under the circumstances, women also need to understand when playing to win is more important than being nice and putting the needs of others first. The ability to differentiate when collaboration that will yield maximum results is needed from when going flat out to win should be employed moves you from nice girl to winning woman. Barbara is a workplace example of someone who didn't understand the game. She worked as a director of marketing in the banking industry for many years. She reached the point in her career where she was so successful that she was sought after for senior positions by a number of companies. She selected one in the specialty chemical business, where she entered as a vice president. When she was referred to me for coaching, she could not understand why she was foundering. Everything that had worked for her in banking failed her in her new position. Her polite, laid-back way of managing and interacting with others was now seen as weak and indecisive. Not understanding that this was a new ball game, Barbara played the new game by the old rules and found herself facing the possibility of failure for the first time in her career. In a more competitive business, or when working for someone who values competition, you've got to play to win, or you'll soon find yourself on the bench. Not only is business a game, but the rules of the game change from organization to organization and from department to department within an organization. What works with one boss may not work with the next one. Keeping your eye on the ball is essential when it comes to winning the game of business. Coaching tips. Learn to play chess. It will help you develop a more strategic mind when it comes to winning games. Make a list of the rules of the game at your workplace. Remember, these are usually unspoken expectations for how fast trackers should behave. Rather than completing it in one sitting, you may have to compile the list gradually as you observe interactions, memos, and meetings in a different way than you have in the past. Examples of rules in some workplaces include, don't disagree with the boss. Everyone works at least 10 hours of overtime. Being polite is more important than being right. Deadlines must be met no matter what the circumstance. Budgets are strictly adhered to the customer always comes first, and so on. As you make your list, begin thinking about how your behavior compares with the expectations. Read Hardball for Women, Winning at the Game of Business, Revised Edition by Pat Heim, Ph.D., and Susan Gallant. It will help you better understand the male business culture and how to use it to your advantage. Among the tips provided are ways to be assertive without being obnoxious, how to engage in smart self-promotion, and methods to display confidence, even when you may feel powerless. Identify a mentor, someone who is successful at playing the game and with whom you can openly discuss the rules in your organization. It's often helpful to have both a man and a woman as mentors, as each will have invaluable guidance for success. If you don't currently play a sport, start. It doesn't matter whether it's tennis, kickboxing, softball, or golf. Playing sports helps you learn the language of the game. Mistake two, playing the game safely and within bounds. As an avid but quite average tennis player, I used to hit the ball squarely within bounds for fear of going out and losing the point. In an effort to play safely, I artificially narrowed my playing field. After a while, it occurred to me that I would never win the game playing that way. I had to learn to hit the ball toward the edges, yet within bounds, if I ever hoped to win. So I started going outside of my comfort zone and found that I actually won more games. In any game, points aren't won in the middle of the field, they're won at the edge. Taking calculated risks might sometimes cause you to go out of bounds, but as long as you win the majority of points, you won't lose the game. 
it's important to get yourself out of the women's safe zone and toward the edge of the field where the winners are playing. I had the opportunity to use this analogy with a client who was recently promoted to supervisor and getting feedback that she wasn't proactive enough. How can I be accused of not being proactive, she wondered. I do everything I'm supposed to without being asked. Doing everything you're supposed to isn't being proactive. It's only doing what you're supposed to. At her new level, management expected her to take more responsibility and make decisions independently. When I suggested this to her, she said she didn't want to overstep her authority. So she ran most important decisions by her supervisor first. I asked the woman if she played tennis, and fortunately she did. Within moments of using the analogy of playing it safe in tennis, she got it. She could understand how she wasn't using all the court available to her. By making assumptions about what would and wouldn't be acceptable to her management, she narrowed her playing field. Rather than risk hitting the ball out of bounds, she engaged only in behaviors she knew would land the ball squarely within the court. It wasn't enough for the woman's manager, who wanted her team members to take calculated risks and go beyond what was asked of them. This same phenomenon plays out in the workplace all the time. Even when a woman knows the workplace is a game, she has the tendency to play safe rather than play smart. She obeys all the rules to the letter and expects others to as well. If the policy says don't do it, then it can't be done. If it might upset someone, she doesn't do it. You never want to act unethically, but it is a game, and one you want to win. To do so, you have to use the entire field available to you. In my client's case, she followed my suggestion to ask her manager to help her define her scope of authority so that she would feel more comfortable taking risks. The manager called me several weeks later and, during the course of conversation about another matter, mentioned that the woman was now showing more initiative and meeting her performance objectives. Coaching tips. Play the game within bounds, but at the edges. If you're not sure where the edges of your company's playing field are, look at the women in your workplace who are winning the game. Consider what they're doing that you should be doing, too. Write down two rules you interpret narrowly and always follow. Have you seen other people bend these rules? If so, what's happened to them? If nothing, then take the risk of stretching the bounds by broadly rather than narrowly interpreting the rules. If you're not sure something is fair, do it anyway. If you're not sure something is ethical, ask. If you're called out, don't take it personally, and by all means, don't revert to playing safe. Look at it as an opportunity to learn where the edge of the boundary is and how to play to it. Mistake three, assuming the rules, boundaries, and strategies are the same for everyone. This is by far the most controversial issue I discuss in my keynote presentations. I intentionally left it out of the first edition because I wasn't sure how readers would respond. I chose to play it safe. Now, after receiving so much positive feedback from groups that I've spoken to, along with some pushback from those finding it patently unfair, I feel I not only should, but must include it, because to do otherwise would be an egregious oversight. If you've ever wondered why, when you say something in the exact same way a male counterpart says it, you get called a bitch, and he gets called assertive, it's because the rules, boundaries, and strategies are different for men and women and for people of color and Caucasians. I don't think it's fair or right, but it does explain why people are treated and evaluated differently at work. Women can't play by the same rules as men and expect to win the game. Right or wrong, we live in a society where we don't like men who act like women and we don't like women who act like men. Imagine if Warren Buffett cried during an earnings call. People would think the oracle from Omaha had completely lost it. Similarly, when women exceed the boundaries of acceptability for assertiveness in their corporate culture, they risk getting called out, called names, or called on the carpet. Now let's consider the assertive playing field for women of color. The boundaries are even narrower. 
As a Caucasian woman, I can say things in a more assertive manner without going out of bounds than can a woman of color. When a woman of color, particularly African-American women, are assertive, they are wrongly accused of being angry. Cultural issues that go into understanding the strength of their messages, such as having strong female role models and the acceptability of louder communications, are ignored, and they are categorized in a way that disinclines them from speaking their minds in the future, which just might be the purpose of the accusation to begin with. Renata was just such a woman. As the CIO, Chief Information Officer at a multinational women's clothing firm, she was smart, no-nonsense, articulate, hardworking, and quick on her feet. If she were a man, she'd be envied. But because she was an African-American woman, she was feared. When she was referred to me for coaching, I conducted interviews with her peers, her management, and people who reported to her. In the vaguest terms, they described her as capable, but not in sync with the corporate culture. This is usually code for, she goes out of bounds. Personally, I liked Renata and saw that she had a lot of value to add to her employer, but their playing field was so narrowly defined that she would have to turn herself into a pretzel to conform to it. This was an unfortunate circumstance where, despite my best efforts to help her see it wasn't her, but the culture that needed changing, and there was nothing either of us could do about that, she refused to adjust her behavior. Instead, she continued acting and communicating in ways that were most comfortable for her, but not for those around her. In the best of all worlds, I would have liked her to find a bigger playing field where she could simultaneously be herself and be appreciated. But instead, her intransigence around change caused her to ultimately be terminated. One additional thing to remember is that the rules, boundaries, and strategies don't only change for women and people of color, they change from company to company and boss to boss. What makes you successful in one company or with one boss won't always hold true in a different company or with a different boss. Each corporate culture has its own unique rules of engagement. I was talking about the playing field concept to a group of women at a defense contractor. Instead of using assertiveness to illustrate my point, I used creativity. After explaining that the boundaries for creativity in the entertainment industry are almost non-existent, whereas the boundaries for creativity in the defense industry are narrower, wacky ideas aren't embraced in quite the same way as in entertainment, a woman raised her hand and said, that explains everything. It turns out she had recently transferred to this company from a film studio, and as she put it, whereas I could do nothing wrong in my last job, I could do nothing right in my current one. Coaching tips. Size up the playing field in your organization and identify the rules and boundaries for various behaviors. This, in turn, will help you to create strategies for successfully maneuvering the field within bounds but at the edge. Consciously decide if it's you or the size of the field that's holding you back. Sometimes we receive feedback that would be true on any field, in which case it's best to take it to heart and act on it. At other times, the feedback is unique to the situation or company. If in every job you've had, you've heard that you don't communicate crisply enough, then it's time to do something about it. Understand that it is unlikely that you will change the size of the playing field to suit your needs. Playing your game at the edge can help to stretch the boundaries, but if it's too narrowly defined for you, start looking for a bigger field. When transferring to a new company or a different boss, don't over-rely on past strengths to build your credibility. They may or may not work. If you find yourself challenged by the transition, assess the new playing field by observing the behaviors of the people who seem to be winning the game. You might need to add some of their actions to your toolkit. If you're a manager or business owner, focus on making the playing field equal for everyone by avoiding stereotyped judgments, proactively valuing and capitalizing on diversity, and holding people accountable for treating everyone equitably. Mistake four, dancing around pregnancy. What should be the happiest moment of your life becomes one of the scariest when you realize you're going to have to tell the boss about it. 
You obsess over the right time to do it, how to do it, and whether it will cause him or her to treat you differently. You try to hide it, avoid it, or play it down, when what you really want to do is shout it loud, I'm pregnant and proud. I know there are many pundits who suggest that you should keep your pregnancy on the DL, down low, for as long as possible, but I'm not one of them. Men don't keep the impending births of their children a secret, at least not intentionally, and you shouldn't have to either. The difference, of course, is that it's not expected that a man's performance will be impacted by the birth of his child, but it's expected that a woman's performance will be. Like everything else that you do with your career, this presents yet another opportunity for you to be strategic. Marissa Meyer made a splash when on the same day the company announced her appointment as CEO of Yahoo, she announced that she was six months pregnant. I have no doubt that she told the board of directors before accepting the offer. I also have no doubt that she assured them she was up for the challenge, pregnant or not. Her promotion despite her pregnancy was touted as a win for women in the workplace, but not so fast. Another situation that was compared with Myers was that of Jennifer Christensen, an associate director of consumer marketing at the pharmaceutical company Bayer, a client of mine and a company that I consider to be a great place for women to work. A major difference, however, was that the pregnant Christensen asked if she could participate in the company's job-sharing program. Despite the fact that she had a history of outstanding performance, her boss refused to allow her to take advantage of the program and supposedly said, I need to stop hiring women of reproductive age. While on maternity leave, Christensen was terminated and is now part of a $100 million class action suit against the company. There is no doubt about it. If you're pregnant in the workplace, you're between a rock and a hard place. When you hide your pregnancy for fear of what others will think, you wind up looking less than honest and perhaps even deceptive. If you announce it sooner than later, others may make judgments about your capabilities or commitment. I believe the only thing your employer really cares about at the end of the day is that you get your job done. Whereas Meyer made her pregnancy a non-issue, Christensen asked for more flexible working hours. Regardless of what policies are in place that provide consideration for pregnancy, by assuring your management that you're not going to miss a beat, you appear more confident and in control of things when you belly up to the bar early on this one. Pun intended. One more thing to note while I'm on the subject of working moms is taking advantage of other company policies such as flex time and telecommuting. After the birth of her third child, I asked a woman who works in publishing, a field dominated by women, if she was working flex hours. Without hesitation, she said no. To do so would be the kiss of death. Consequently, I've consulted with other women to get their input, and it's been the same. Their strategy, and I think it's a wise one, is to simply take time off or work from home when a family situation requires them to do so. As each woman implied, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Formally requesting flex time as a steady diet contributes to the opinion that you're less than committed to the job. Before you start sending me irate letters and email, let me say I'm a huge proponent of creating avenues for women to be able to work while still meeting the expectation that they will be the primary caretakers for their children. It's an unfair burden that is placed on women in society. Although savvy companies are addressing the issue in an effort to retain talented women and the fact that there are laws to protect pregnant women, it remains a hot-button topic. So hot, in fact, that when Google's Marissa Meyer abolished telecommuting soon after assuming the position of CEO, she was accused of being sexist and having no concern for women without the same resources and stature that she has. I disagree with the critics. Meyer defended her position by saying that people are more creative and innovative when working collaboratively, and that is best achieved in the office. It was a business decision based on the needs of the company at the time. Coaching Tips Announce your pregnancy when you're ready. For a variety of reasons, it does not have to be the moment it's confirmed by your doctor. You're entitled to your privacy. Decide on a time that makes the most sense to you and your significant other. 
Accompany your announcement with a clear and definitive statement of what can be expected of you during the pregnancy and after. In no uncertain terms, inform your management that you will continue to perform at the level you always have, will prepare for your absence so that nothing slips between the cracks, and will return to work fit for resuming your duties. Handle pregnancy-related issues morning sickness, doctor's appointments, and so on, on a case-by-case -case basis in the same manner you handle all other personal issues. If you need to miss work, don't go into graphic detail about why. Simply inform whoever needs to be informed that you'll be late or out and offer assurance that the projects you're working on are on track for completion. Give yourself permission to change your mind about your priorities. For Marissa Meyer, it was business as usual before and after the birth of her son. If at any point you realize that for health or personal reasons, you can't work at the same pace or the same hours as you have in the past, then honor your values. Be clear about your priorities and live your life in a way that reflects your commitment to them. This is your life, no one else's. Starting a family may significantly change your perspective about the importance of work or family. No one will take away your card to the sacred women's club because you choose to focus more on one or the other. Mistake 5. Sitting out the social network game. Remember how your parents used to tell you that just because everyone else was doing something, that didn't mean you should? When it comes to social networking, they were wrong. I'm the first to admit that social networking can be a nuisance. I have more important things to do than check my Facebook page or be interrupted by an incoming feed that tells me where someone is having lunch today. One tech-savvy friend went so far as to call me a Luddite. I had to look that one up. Yet, like it or not, we live in an age where social networking is not a nice-to, but rather a must-do if we want to be considered in the know. Even I grudgingly have to agree that when used properly, the advantages of social networking include that it makes you appear as if you belong in the 21st century, allows you to market yourself, enables you to engage in my number one rule for success, build strong 360-degree relationships, gives you access to what the competition is up to, provides you with a forum to exchange ideas or solicit opinions, enhances your credibility as a subject matter expert, and can be a fun and efficient way to keep up with colleagues. The key phrase here is used properly. Unfortunately, many women don't realize the web footprint they leave with their Facebook pages, LinkedIn accounts, and tweeting. As a result, they do more potential damage to their reputations and credibility than they do good. I'll talk more about that in the chapter on personal branding, but for now, suffice it to say that if you're not engaged in social networking, it's time to buy a front row seat to this game. Coaching tips. Set up a Facebook page and use it for business purposes only. In subsequent mistakes, you'll find coaching tips for how to maximize its value to you and how to avoid common pitfalls when engaging in social networking. Join LinkedIn, the social networking site for professionals. By nature, it limits what you can post and whom you can communicate with, and vice versa. It's designed to showcase you professionally and enable you to network with people with whom you have colleagues in common. Create your own personal website. It's an inexpensive way to market your brand while having control over content, although not necessarily over who visits the site. Check out Weebly.com for an inexpensive place to establish numerous websites and blogs. Mistake 6. Overlooking the importance of mentors and sponsors advocates. The September 2010 issue of Harvard Business Review contained an article titled Why Men Still Get More Promotions Than Women by Herminia Ibarra, Nancy M. Carter, and Christine Silva. The premise of this piece is that women receive fewer promotions than men because they're less likely to have mentors who are also advocates for them. The authors found through their research, quote, there is a special kind of relationship called sponsorship in which the mentor goes beyond giving feedback and advice and uses his or her influence with senior executives to advocate for the mentee. 
our interviews and surveys alike suggest that high-potential women are over-mentored and under-sponsored relative to their male peers, and that they are not advancing in their organizations. Furthermore, without sponsorship, women not only are less likely than men to be appointed to top roles, but may also be more reluctant to go for them, end quote. The difference between mentoring and advocacy, or sponsorship, is the level of active involvement in helping you with your career. Mentors offer advice and guidance that help you to grow in your career, in your field, and within your company. Advocates, on the other hand, speak up for you on your behalf in your absence, introduce you to people who might be able to help you and vice versa, and put you on the radar screens of people who can help further your career. As I mentioned previously, mentors can also help you to learn the rules of the road and find the edge of the playing field. Yet many women are reluctant to ask someone to mentor them because they fear it's an imposition. They don't feel connected enough to the people who could mentor them, or they don't know whom to ask to be a mentor. The following tips will help you overcome these and other challenges and increase the likelihood of getting both mentorship and sponsorship. Coaching Tips Find out if your company has a formal or informal mentoring program. If so, this is the place to identify a few people who could potentially mentor you. Again, it's not a bad idea to have a male and a female mentor because each will have unique experiences that will add to your understanding of how to play the game to win on your corporate playing field. If your company does not have a mentoring program, look to the edge of the playing field. That's where the people who are winning the game are playing. Identify a few people you admire and ask if they would be willing to spend 30 minutes to one hour a month or even a quarter with you to answer questions you have about career issues. Be specific about the amount of time you're asking for so they don't think that this is going to take an inordinate amount of time. Also, make it clear that you will be responsible for getting on their calendars and driving the agenda. The easier you make it for the person, the more likely they are to agree to mentor you. Go to the website mentoringgroup.com and order The Mentor's Guide and The Mentee's Guide. These two pamphlets are extraordinarily helpful in establishing roles and responsibilities in mentoring. During your first meeting with your mentor, give him or her The Mentor's Guide. Explain what you've learned from your own guide and use it to discuss the terms of engagement for your relationship. Ask for situation-specific advocacy from people in positions to provide it. These people might include your mentors, but possibly also individuals who do not mentor you yet are familiar with your work and are in positions to provide you with visibility or recommendations. Situation-specific means asking for advocacy related to a particular opportunity, not simply asking the person to keep you in mind when a good opportunity arises. For example, ask an advocate to write a letter of recommendation for a promotion you're up for or to recommend you for a committee that will get high visibility from executive management. The more specific you are, the more likely the person is to take action. Join the appropriate affinity group within your company. Many companies have initiated groups for people with common workplace challenges as a means of providing support for them. Find out if your company has such a group for women and or for people of color, and if so, join it. You'll often find senior women involved in these groups who want to mentor younger or less senior women, making your task of asking for a mentor that much less daunting. Mistake seven, working hard. There's a popular saying, women have to work twice as hard to be considered half as good. As a result, women are like tiny little ants, working, working, working. They complain that they do more than anyone else, and they do. It's a myth that people get ahead because they work hard. The truth is, no one ever got promoted purely because of hard work. Likeability, strategic thinking, networking, and being a team player are but a few of the other factors that go into crafting a successful career. In every organization, there's a baseline for hard work. In some organizations, that baseline is higher than in others. 
I work with a lot of professional and financial services firms where working hard is not only expected, it's required. Women, however, take it to the extreme, working far harder than their male colleagues. When you consistently go over that baseline, you aren't always recognized, but you usually are given more work to do because you've shown you can and will do it. Sometimes I think women work hard because it's easier to do what they know best rather than to engage in behaviors that seem foreign to them. One woman complained to me about the guy she worked with who, every Monday morning during football season, spent the first half hour of the day rehashing Sunday's games with the boss. What a waste of time. Here I am working away and they're talking about football, she lamented. What bothered her even more was the fact that these same guys were being tapped for prime assignments, whereas women see it as wasting the company's money to do anything less than focus on the task at hand between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., men know that whether it's talking about football or last weekend's golf scores, they're building relationships that will later work for them. In this situation, her male coworkers were bonding with the boss in a way that allowed him to better know these team members. As a result, when growth opportunities became available, he picked them because he was familiar and comfortable with them. And herein lies one of business's best-kept secrets. People aren't hired and promoted simply because they work hard. It happens because the decision-maker knows the character of the person and feels confident about his or her ability not only to do the job, but also to do it in a way that promotes collegial team relationships. By keeping her nose to the grindstone, the woman was actually acting in a way detrimental to getting what she most wanted, more interesting work and an opportunity to show she was capable of doing more. Coaching Tips Give yourself permission to waste a little time. If you're not spending 5% of your day building relationships, you're doing something wrong. Define your work hours and stick with them. Remember Parkinson's Law. Work expands to fill the time available. This isn't to say there won't be times when you must work overtime, but if you're consistently the last one left at the office, there's something wrong with that picture. At the beginning of each day, Define what you want to accomplish. You can avoid the tendency to take on whatever comes across your desk during the course of the day by deliberately scheduling it for a later time. Mistake 8. Doing the work of others. When Harry S. Truman said, the buck stops here, surely he was thinking of a woman. Our tendency to take responsibility for not only our own work, but also the work of others, is yet another self-defeating behavior. Yes, you have a responsibility to your employer to ensure the delivery of a high-quality product or service, but it is not your responsibility alone. Women have a nasty habit of saying, well, if I don't do it, no one else will. This only ensures that you'll be doing it, and for a long time. And there's another problem associated with taking too much responsibility. While women are doing the grunt work, men are building their careers. They're no fools. Promotions are rewards for getting the job done, not necessarily for doing the job. I had a boss once who told me there are two kinds of people in the world, careerists and achievers. Achievers keep busy by doing the work. Careerists spend their time managing their careers. Truth be known, you've got to be a little of both to get ahead. Coaching tips. Stop volunteering for low-profile, low-impact assignments. If necessary, sit on your hand rather than raise it. Recognize when people delegate inappropriately to you. Practice saying unapologetically, you know, I'd love to help you out with this, but I am swamped. Then stop talking. Avoid the inclination to want to solve the problem for others. It's their problem, not yours. If you're a manager or a supervisor, don't let people delegate up. This most often happens when people reporting to you claim to be unable to perform a task or say they don't have the time. Avoid the tendency to take it over because it will be faster if you do it yourself. Instead, Suggest that they ask a coworker for technical assistance, or if you have the time, use it as a teaching opportunity. 
Use self-talk to replace feeling guilty about saying no. Try saying something like, I don't have to feel guilty about seeing that my needs are met. Mistake nine, working without a break. There's certainly truth to the adage, if you need something done, give it to a woman. Women will work nonstop to crank out a project. Working without a break is not only damaging to your health, but actually impedes optimum performance as well. Productivity experts suggest that a break every 90 minutes is required to maintain maximum levels of concentration and accuracy. From a productivity standpoint, there are diminishing marginal returns when you ask your brain to exert constant effort through an eight-hour day, says Dr. Janet Scarborough Civitelli, a workplace psychologist at vocationvillage.com. Working without a break also contributes to the impression that you're flustered or inefficient. One executive told me that a female vice president reporting to him made him feel uncomfortable because she always looked like she was overworked and harried, a word you rarely hear used to describe a man. Working through lunch hours or without coming up for air won't get you ahead. Giving the impression you are always up to your ears and alligators could hinder being given special projects or assignments that could later bring you recognition. And if you're not convinced yet, According to self-proclaimed time management ninja Craig Jarrow, there are five more good reasons why you should take breaks. Number one, gain perspective. If your head is down in your work, you aren't aware of your surrounding environment. Priorities may have changed since you started your project. A break can let you zoom in and out again. Number two, recharge. Everyone needs to fill their tanks or eventually their energy reserves will reach zero. Rest is needed to let the body and the mind recharge. Number three, refocus. It is easy to get distracted and pulled off task. Taking a break can let you address those distractions and then refocus your energy on the more important tasks. Number four, get advice. No one can operate entirely independently. Seeking advice from others can save you much time and effort. Maybe they have previously done what you are doing and can provide time-saving tips. And number five, take care of yourself. Life is a marathon, not a sprint. You can't keep going at 100% without burning yourself out. Even top-notch machines will burn out if they're not maintained. Make sure you are maintaining yourself. Coaching tips. Get in the habit of getting up from your desk for a stretch break at least once every 90 minutes. At the beginning of each week, make it a point to schedule at least one lunch meeting. Schedule times throughout the day to drop by a colleague's office for a few minutes of casual conversation. When someone drops by yours, stop what you're doing and invite him or her in. Use the alarm function on your computer to remind you of your break. And when it goes off, take your break. Use the lunch hour to your advantage. Join a Toastmasters club, run an errand that will allow you to get home a little earlier after work, or just take a walk and refresh yourself for your afternoon activities. If about now you're thinking, I don't have time for this, then you're definitely doing too much at work. Mistake 10, being naive. Women may not have the market on naivete, but we certainly do our fair share of taking what people say at face value. The dynamic behind this is interesting. We often don't probe deeply enough to determine the veracity of what we're told, either because we don't want to embarrass the other person or because we want to see only the good in people. By busily focusing on the work itself, we often miss the more obvious behaviors that lie on the periphery. Lisa was someone whose naivete got her into trouble. She was the director of development for a nationally known nonprofit agency. Her department was efficient. There was a good sense of teamwork and camaraderie among her staff. And every year that Lisa was at the helm, they surpassed their fundraising goals. Until she hired Adam, that is. He was the son of one of the board members, and her colleagues at the agency warned her it was not a good idea to hire him. Lisa was sure that if she established ground rules and kept the lines of communication open with Adam, it would work out just fine. Within a few months, the team began to falter, 
Morale was spiraling downward. Team members weren't hitting their monthly targets. Several team members confided in Lisa that Adam was bad-mouthing her behind her back and spreading lies about her. Lisa's manager called her into his office several times to discuss the unrest on her team. For the first time in her career, she was seen as a less-than-capable leader. When she openly discussed the problem with Adam, he denied doing anything to undermine her authority. She wanted to believe him and reiterated her expectations of him. The problem only went from bad to worse. Board members were beginning to question the head of the agency about problems that kept surfacing. Finally, Lisa left the agency for a better position, but not one she would have considered before Adam had come along. When we see naivete in another person, we often find it refreshing. Sometimes young people just beginning their careers benefit from it by making others want to mentor them or show them the rules of the road. When we see it in a more seasoned professional, however, we use it to discredit them. A woman's expression of naivete underscores her inability to read a situation appropriately or learn from her experience. Coaching tips. If something doesn't make sense to you, ask for an explanation. If someone downplays your need for an explanation, be suspicious. Without assuming the worst, get in the habit of asking yourself what a person's motives might be. Don't rely on just one person's expertise when making major decisions. Solicit input from several reliable sources. If you find yourself the only person in the room who disagrees with the consensus that it can't be done, and you think, but I could make it happen, an alarm should go off that you're being naive. Trust your instincts. If it looks like a duck, sounds like a duck, and walks like a duck, it's a duck. Read Spy the Lie by Philip Houston, Michael Floyd, and Susan Carnicero. Former CIA agents help you to identify deceptive behaviors before you fall prey to them.